This is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live, and Jacob's back in England, and this is This Week in Prophecy. Greetings of Jesus. Wonderful to be back in the UK from Australia, New Zealand, and Vietnam. Soon on our way to the USA, but right now we are in Mother England. Let's look at what has transpired and what is transpiring this week in prophecy. As we speak, the aftermath of the latest Islamic terrorist attack in Barcelona, Spain, is flooding the newspaper headlines and international TV news coverage, saturating the internet. Once again, it has happened. My fear, and the fear of many people, is it's going to become so, so commonplace that the Muslim mayor of London's words will be, prove true. All right, well, London Mayor Sadiq Khan recently said that the terror attacks are part and parcel now for big cities. Former UK Independence Party leader Nigel Farage says that kind of thinking is a mistake. In other words, what he is saying, Nigel, is that uh, uh, you got to deal with it. It's just, it's just life in big cities. Uh, what did you make of that and the message it sends? Well, I think there's a bit of a trend here because just two days after that horrendous lorry attack that took place in Nice, back on July the 14th. Two days afterwards, the French Prime Minister, Manuel Valls, said that this is a part of life in modern-day France. So, Valls says it in Nice. Uh, Sadiq Khan says that it applies to big cities. I mean, you may as well just put up the white flag of surrender uh, to say, well, you know, we're just going to normalise terrorism. And what makes me really annoyed is it's the very same political class who have, whenever anybody has questioned open door Im immigration. Whenever anybody says, look, surely we should security check people, we should make sure that newcomers into our country agree with our values, gets condemned. And what I'd like to see from the French Prime Minister and from Sadiq Khan, before they say anything, is an apology for what their policies and their ideas have done to all of us. But Nigel, this does seem to be a, a, a growing sentiment among political leaders who say, yeah. Uh, we acknowledge terror and the threat, but don't make too big a deal of it. John Kerry, our Secretary of State, recently saying that he wished the media wouldn't constantly cover it, words to that effect. Uh, we've mm -hmm. even, uh, you know, heard uh, those who are on the other side of the aisle, uh, you know, including First Homeland Security Secretary Tom Ridge saying more people are killed in, in car crashes and all that than, than what happened with terrorists. All true. But I think they minimize the threat when they minimize the numbers and compare them to other numbers. Uh, what do you think? Well, that's right. And I mean, Bill de Blasio, you know, is still in denial, it seems to me, about what happened in New York last week. Every time we get one of these horrendous incidents, uh, more in Europe than America, but wherever they take place, you know, immediately this same clique of people rush to say, of course, it's got nothing to do with terror. It's certainly got nothing to do with religion. Uh, you know, this is just kind of, just get on with it, guys. This is part of our everyday life. And they're in denial. Uh, they cannot admit to the people the extent of their failure. And they don't want to have an open, honest debate about how we deal with this. All right. Now, an open, honest debate, Donald Trump says, would be to recognize a war on terror, a, an actual war. He has said if he became president, he'd get a plan from his top generals within 30 days to take out ISIS once and for all. Uh, is that even possible now, given the fact that ISIS and these other terror groups seem so widespread, they almost don't need a homeland. They're everywhere. Yeah, I think, I mean, look, the fact that Trump you know, is talking about borders, is talking about security, is saying uh, that the US government has a responsibility to its own citizens. All of that is absolutely right and I think may well win him this presidential election. But when it comes to taking out ISIS, that's not so simple. Uh, you know, there isn't just sort of one command centre. In fact, in many ways, ISIS is a little bit like the multi-headed Hydra. There are lots of little bits of ISIS all over the place. Uh, I 
I am yet to be convinced that there is a military means to simply take out ISIS unless we're prepared to accept that we work with Middle Eastern and North African governments and fight a campaign that may last for 10 or 20 years. But we can't do it. America and Britain, on their own, cannot do this without possibly stoking up more young generations to move towards the ISIS cause. We've got to get those countries and those armies involved as well. You know, there's still some debate, as you and I are speaking, I of Seattle, or north of Seattle, Washington State, uh, a mall attack that involved five deaths, uh, a gentleman behind that, but we're told of Hispanic descent, and as if people were bending over backwards not to say Middle Eastern descent. Now, they may be proven right, I have no idea, but there's a real reluctance to attach anything that looks like this could be something bigger than it first appears. Now, I understand that you don't want to jump to conclusions, but the knee-jerk sure. reaction, invariably, just as it was last week in New York, don't call yeah. it, you know, a terrorist event. Yeah, I, you know, this is denial, and we see a political class in denial. We see quite large sections of the liberal media equally in denial. Um, and, of course, you know, what they fear is if they admit the truth, and if they admit their failings, uh, that Trump will get even stronger in this campaign. So whatever no. happens, whatever happens between now and November the 8th, expect these people to go on denying. And Hillary, top of the tree for that. We shall see. Probably it will come up once or twice in the debate. Nigel Farage, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We should just accept terror is going to be a way of life in the Western world. Once you accept Islam is going to be a feature of Western culture, and Islam is going to have a permanent community presence in civilized Western nations, it automatically follows suit that radical Islamists are going to emerge from their midst. And those who oppose it, of course, deemed racist and Islamophobes, were expected to turn a deaf ear and a blind eye to the reality that terror will become a way of life in the Western world until and unless the Western world stands up. And when somebody does, be it Gerd Wilders in Holland, or be it Nigel Farage in the UK, or be it Donald Trump in the USA, they are the ones who are denounced, not the perpetrators of terror, which is fundamentalist Islam. We're told the lie that it's only a small percentage of Muslims who support this, when in fact it is a substantial percentage. And now countries are again, once again, reaping what they sowed. Terror attacks are becoming commonplace in Europe and will do in the United States if the liberal establishment has its way. By the liberal establishment, I, of course, do not mean simply the Democratic Party. I mean the rhinocrats in the American Senate and Congress who are no better and no different. Uh, the establishment Republicans, such as the Bush family and so forth, who are in bed with the Saudi Arabians, the same old story. These people don't care what happens to our countries. They've easily betrayed us repeatedly. We've had the betrayal of America in the aftermath of September 11th to the Saudi interests, who funded Al-Qaeda by the Bush family and the Bush administration. We've seen this betrayal of Barack Obama and John Kerry handing America's security over to an Iran that's becoming increasingly nuclear-armed and increasingly funding terror and developing guided ballistic missile systems to deliver nuclear weapons, courtesy of the 150 billion placed into their hands, 150 billion dollars in unfrozen funds by Barack Obama. Again, we're talking about a betrayal of the nation, to say nothing of our allies, such as Israel and so-called moderate Islamic states, although that in itself is a joke and a misnomer. There are no moderate Islamic states. There are only ones who are fundamentalists and ones who are radical, but there are no moderates. Nonetheless, let's move on as we speak. Uh, a dear Muriel patron in the UK uh, has had a relative seriously injured in Spain in this recent attack. I got a uh, text in the middle of the night asking for emergency prayer for her, and so we are certainly praying for this relative of a dear friend and Moriel supporter who organizes some of our meetings in London. 
uh, it hits close to home. It's hit close to home in America, it's hit close to home in Israel, and it's hitting close to home in England. It will affect all of us unless we get leaders who will stand up. The real problem, however, is not radical Islamists. The real problem is our own left-wing idiocrats who will not deal with them. This is right throughout Spain, and it is just as ripe in the United States. You have ABC News comparing Bible-believing Christians to radical Islamists. You have people like Rosie O'Donnell saying we're six of one, half dozen of the other, putting Christians in the same category with radical Islamists. I do. Hold on one second. We, we were attacked not by a nation. And as a result of the attack and the killing of nearly 3,000 innocent people, we invaded two countries and killed innocent people but in their country. But you understand that, that the belief funding those attacks, okay, that is widespread. And if you take radical Islam and you want to talk about what's going on there, you have and to... And just you, one second, have to radical use. Christianity is just as threatening as radical Islam. In a country like America, Anything, we, where we have a separation of church and state. We're, we're a democracy. We're not, we're not bombing ourselves here in the country. We no, are, but we are bombing innocent people in other countries. True but, or but, false? But Christians are, are not threatening to kill us. No, we're talking it's about there's safety difference. here. And if you well, this is, of course, absurd. Christians don't commit terrorist attacks like this. Radical Islamists, of course, do. But when Donald Trump correctly and accurately drew comparisons between the anti-fascist movement, so-called, and the neo-Nazi white supremacists who marched in Charlottesville, Virginia, the mainstream media and the left are again up in arms for him drawing this comparison. Well, it was a very just comparison. First of all, you had approximately 500 right-wing protesters against 2,000 left-wing protesters trying to remove the statue of Robert E. Lee or demanding that the statue of Robert E. Lee be removed and others were protesting it. Some of those who protested its removal applied for a license to protest peacefully. They were not all neo-Nazis. Nonetheless, the Nazis and white supremacists took over, were waving Nazi flags and Nazi banners. I see very much an equivalency and I don't think that Donald Trump failed to denounce neo-Nazis and white supremacists. He certainly did. He simply drew an accurate equivalence between them and the left. Let's look at it. Nazis and Nazis, anti-Semites and anti-Semites, enemies of human rights and enemies of human rights, enemies of the Constitution and enemies of the Constitution. The alt-left, the anti-fascist movement, as they call themselves, these people are anti-First Amendment. They're anti-free speech. They call this verbal violence. If you say something that they disagree with, they say that you've perpetrated verbal violence, so they have the right to respond with physical violence. This is absurd in itself. They're enemies of the Constitution, enemies of free speech. Well, so are the Nazis. They're six of one, half dozen of the other. They are no better than the Nazis. They are no different. The Nazis did medical experiments on Jewish children. Mengele did these medical experiments. They simply butchered human children for profit. They killed human beings to make soap and to make lamps, but they did medical experiments, contributing nothing, by the way, to the advancement of medical science on children. I've been to the Nazi death camp at Dachau where these things happened. And I say this as the father of Jewish children. And it's a grandfather of a beautiful Jewish grandson. I saw what the Nazis did. I've been to Dachau. I know I've read, I've seen films in Yad Vashem, in Jerusalem and other places and spoken to multiple, multiple Holocaust survivors. I know what happened. Planned Parenthood is no better. We've seen women, female gynecologists in Planned Parenthood joking about how the eye popped out of the skull on a human fetus that could have survived, but was aborted. It was a sufficient age of gestation that it could have survived, but it was a late-term abortion, partial birth abortion. 
twice vetoed by Bill Clinton after Congress outlawed it. Barack Obama voting for late-term abortion when he was in the state senate in Illinois, dragging a baby out of its mother by forceps, doing a suboccipital puncture, sucking its brains out while it's in the process of being alive. How is Planned Parenthood, or these people, how are they any different from the Nazis? They are nuts. They did the same things. Not only is it fake news, Mr. Trump understated the contrast, the moral and behavioral equivalency of the contemporary left and the Nazis. You've got Congressman Ellis, co-chairman of the Democratic National Committee, as Alan Dershowitz fully documented. The man has been involved in gross anti-Semitism. Democrats seem poised anyway at this point to pick a far left extremist, the DNC, Keith Ellison, a congressman from Minnesota. He may be heading out to the DNC now that Howard Dean has pulled out, but after the party was beaten badly, and we're talking very badly, at the polls and lost the support of white working class Americans, why on earth are they out there picking someone like Ellison? I mean, this is someone who at one time supported and worked with the Nation of Islam and Louis Farrakhan. Here's Farrakhan, the guy who was working alongside just a year ago, blasting white people. Watch. Everywhere the white man has gone. His nature drove him to kill. Kill the brown. Kill the red. Kill the yellow. Kill my own white brother and kill the black and make sure that the black never rise again. All right, joining me right now on the prospect of Ellison at the DNC, famed legal scholar Alan Dershowitz, the legend himself. Good to see you. Good to Thank have you, you here. All right, you, you think this is crazy, right, to have somebody like Ellison? It's about the, the dumbest thing among many dumb things the Democrats have done after losing white middle class, working class people in the Midwest, you're going to pick somebody who for nine years was associated with a hate America, anti-American, anti-Western person. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just nuts. And they're going to lose a lot of Democrats well, if they appoint Are they trying to double down? I mean, they, they clearly were wrong in their approach to this election, which they you know, still don't really want to admit, because for some reason it's about women not supporting women, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera, or people just being misogynistic or this, that, and the other. But it, do they just not want to admit it, Alan? I mean, what's, what's going on here? Why would you double down on this strategy that didn't work? Well, it's one thing to have lost this election because you couldn't have anticipated how badly the Democrats could do in the in the Rust Belt, in the Middle West. But now that you know that, you pick as leader of the Democratic Party the worst possible person to bring them back. If I were a Republican strategist and I were given the choice to pick the head of the Democratic National Committee, I'd say pick Ellison. He would be great for the Republicans. And he's going to be great for the Republicans. Already Haim Saban, who's a major contributor to the Democratic Party, has said essentially, don't count on me anymore. He is going to lose many, many Democrats. He's going to lose many pro-Israel Democrats, many pro-American Democrats. Forget about Farrakhan's anti-Semitism mm -hmm. and the fact that this guy was part of that for years. Do you know what he said at one point to somebody when he was a student? at the um, um, Minnesota Law School, Tell us. he said to somebody who was a woman and Jewish, I can have no respect for you. This is Ellison saying this, not Farrakhan. I can have no respect for you because you're Jewish and you're a woman. And as a woman, you shouldn't be working, you should be home. And oh this goodness. is a guy who bought into every negative aspect. And now he's a member of Congress and his voting record is abominable. He said Israel shouldn't be financed to have the Iron Dome that protects Israeli citizens from rocket attacks from, uh, from Gaza. He voted against that. He's one of only eight senators who's voted well, against why Israel Why are more repeatedly. people speaking out? And good for you. But, but why aren't more people saying, my goodness, well, is this really where you, you, know, you want to take the party? Because well, it's going to disintegrate. 
It's not going to disintegrate. It's going to do what's going on all over the world. The left is moving far, 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 far more to the left. It's going to turn the Democratic Party into the British Labour Party. The British Labour Party is headed by a guy named Corbyn, mm -hmm. and they can't win an election for dog catcher. Mm -hmm. And now the Democrats are going to have their essentially Corbyn. He's not as bad as Corbyn, but he's pretty darn bad as the head of the Democratic Party. And you're going to get a lot of centrists saying, I'm no longer a Democrat. I'm not going to register as a Democrat. I'm not going to contribute Listen, I, I, to the Democratic Listen, I meet them all the Party. time here on this show. I mean, I've met quite a few that liked what they heard from, say, Joe Biden, liked what they heard even from Bernie Sanders to a certain extent. And they said, look, I, I can't I, I can't be part of this party anymore as it's had. And who would you, by the way, put in Ellison's place? Well, Jennifer Granholm with the former governor of Michigan, who comes from that part of the country, uh, who has tremendous appeal to mm -hmm. middle class uh, people. If Joe Biden would take it, he would be fantastic. <laughs> he may, he may but, be running but for president. If you Alan. gave me a list of a thousand people. I'd put Ellison a thousand and one. He was the worst possible person at this point in the history of the Democratic Party to pick. And I hope the Democratic leaders will come to their senses and say, all right, we put him out there. That was a sap we sent to oh, the no. Sandernistas, to the hard left of the party. Now let's begin to think about how to win. And you don't win with Ellison. Hopefully they're watching you right now. Thank you so much. Alan, Thank good you. to have you here. All right. We're going to. They're anti Semitic. So are the Nazis. What's the difference? There's no difference between a Nazi and Ellis and Ellis and a Nazi. In terms of anti Semitism, they're the same. White racism? It's ugly. It's shameful. It's disgusting. It's the KKK. It's neo Nazis. It's white supremacists. Vile, disgusting people. But how are they any different than Maxine Waters and other black poverty crats who make their living and keep their power base in the race industry? Perpetuating an underclass of American blacks to keep themselves in power and pocket. How are they any different? Look at the statements made by Maxine Waters. Just look at that woman. They are six of one, half dozen of the other. A racist is a racist. A bigot is a bigot. An anti-Semite is an anti-Semite. A baby killer is a baby killer. An enemy of the Constitution is an enemy of the Constitution. An opponent of the First Amendment is an opponent of the First Amendment. It doesn't matter if they're left, right, black, white. That does not matter. They think the same and they behave the same. It's a Hitler and Stalin scenario. Well, they misrepresent themselves as being at opposite ends of the political and ideological spectrum. In the end of the day, Hitler and Stalin were two of a kind. You can call it a concentration camp or you can call it a gulag. They were the same. They were both people who were influenced by Darwinism. They were both evolutionists. One communist, one Nazi, but they were both socialists. Hitler was a socialist, same as Stalin. There was no difference. There was no difference then and there's no difference now. Ellis was an anti-Semite. The neo-Nazis are anti-Semites. Maxine Waters as a woman who's made racist statements. I consider her to be a bigot. Don't tell me she's any better than the Klan. She ought to put a sheet over her head. She'd fit right in with the rest of them. They wouldn't know she was black. Woods. Professor, always good to have you with us. Thank you. So you heard it there from the Deputy Attorney General that when it comes to this investigation and Mueller, it is not a fishing expedition. What do you make of that? Well, the Justice Department the rules and regulations are very broad. Remember that the special prosecutor who started investigating Bill Clinton about Whitewater ended up uh, accusing him based on uh, a private sexual relationship with Monica Lewinsky. So I don't think that President Trump or his administration should take much solace in the claim by Rosenstein that this is not a fishing expedition, I do think that they're uh, looking to catch uh, Moby Dick, the big whale, and, uh, and that's what uh, the, the special counsel will be after, uh, Donald Trump or anybody as high up in the administration as possible. If he doesn't get somebody, he'll be regarded as a failure who spent a lot of money investigating and came up with nothing. So I think <clears throat> there is very much of an incentive to 
try to come up with something serious. So you're saying the White House should be concerned. How do you think this, this grand jury being impaneled, how does that change things? Well, the fact that it's impaneled in the District of Columbia, they already had a grand jury mm -hmm. impaneled in Virginia. And I think that one of the reasons they moved this to the District of Columbia is that's a completely Democratic district, as distinguished from Virginia, which is a swing state, and it has an ethnic and racial composition that would be somewhat less favorable to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And uh, any, any experienced lawyer understands that both prosecutors and defense attorneys look at factors like ethnicity, uh, race, uh, uh, political affiliation when they decide what uh, venue is best for their case. So uh, yeah. that there's nothing surprising about that, but it does, I think, give a slight advantage to the prosecutor if there were an indictment, if they had to pick a petty jury, uh, either in Virginia or the District of Columbia, they would have an advantage in picking one in the District of Columbia. Well, speaking of ethnicity, you made these comments after it was announced about this, or reported rather, about the grand jury. And Maxine Waters, as you know, has a lot to say about everyone and everything. And she targeted you most recently this past week on MSNBC and reacted mm -hmm. to some comments that you made. Here's what she said. Right. And what he's simply saying, you know, all of those black people are there, and they don't like Trump, and so he's not going to get a fair trial, and so they should take it out of that jurisdiction. It shouldn't be there to begin with. I don't like that, uh, and I'm surprised that Alan Dershowitz is talking like that, and we will not stand for it. We will push back against that, because that is absolutely racist. Obviously, there she's talking about the people that make up this grand jury in Washington, D.C. How do you respond to that? Well, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Uh, first of all, I wasn't talking about the grand jury. I was talking about the petty jury. Grand jury doesn't matter. A grand jury will indict a ham sandwich if the prosecutor wants them to. So it doesn't matter where the grand jury is. But if there were to be an indictment, it would matter greatly where the trial was. Look, uh, Maxine Waters should know better and does know better. She knows that every experienced lawyer, white, black, uh, Asian, Latino, knows that when you're selecting a jury, factors like ethnicity, race, political affiliation, uh, a matter. Uh, if I had said that race didn't matter, she'd have called me a racist. She throws around the term so loosely and so inappropriately, and it, it weakens her credibility just by calling everybody a racist, by calling me a racist. When she calls real racists racists, nobody is going to uh, believe her. Uh, would she have called Johnny Cochran a racist when he obviously understood that the racial composition of the jury in the O.J. Simpson case mattered a great deal. Race matters. And Maxine Waters ought to know that, and she ought to be ashamed of herself. You know, being black doesn't give you a license to call people racist any more than being Jewish mm -hmm. gives you a license to call people anti-Semitic. So she ought to understand that every criminal defense lawyer knows that race matters, ethnicity matters, political affiliation matters. Uh, we're not talking about computers here. We're talking about real jurors making real decisions, and jurors make decisions based on their life experience. Right. And race and ethnicity is part of everyone's life experience. And Maxine Waters, more than anyone, ought to know that. So she just tossed it around uh, and targeted yeah. me uh, for no, no good reason. She ought to be ashamed of herself. Professor, some strong words there in reaction and from a lifelong Democrat. Always good to have you on the show. Have a wonderful Sunday. Thank Thanks you. Here. They do the same. They're enemies of free speech. The enemies of what America stands for. The ones who are lying are the mainstream media and the left as usual. This is what's really happening. Fake news with a capital F. The only thing Mr. Trump is guilty of in this particular situation is understating the equivalency not by stating that there is one. He's understated the equivalency. Planned Parenthood are going to the same hell as Joseph Mengele for the same reason. They butchered innocent babies. They will burn in the same hell forever. The Ku Klux Klan are disgusting and reprehensible. So is Maxine Waters. They're both bigoted. An anti-Semite like Ellis and an anti-Semite like David Duke. Six of one, half dozen of the other. There's no difference. Both oppose free speech. Both are enemies of the Constitution. And both need to be stopped. 
one is as bad as the other. But let's move on. The Nazis didn't treat women very well. Uh, either does Linda Sauser. <laughs> she's pro-Sharia, yet she's a hero of the left. Quite a situation. It's not even rational. Of all the people on the face of the earth, who should be more opposed to Islam than feminists and homosexuals? That awkward moment when self-proclaimed feminists in Germany embrace the most patriarchal, misogynistic, anti-woman belief system on the planet. Aggressive pro women facet of Islam, do you think they were championing? Honor killings, female rape victims being stoned to death, mass sexual assaults, forced marriages of children, a prophet who had female sex slaves and raped a nine year old girl, female genital mutilation. So progressive, so liberal. How about parents acid attacking their own daughter because she looked at a boy? A mother and father in adjoining cells accused of dousing their teenage daughter, Anusha, in acid. Her crime, looking at a boy. That gave us something literally called the rape game. But should we be surprised, given that the feminist response to the mass molestation of women in Cologne by Muslim migrants was to visit the local refugee centre and give roses to the migrants? Should we be surprised, given that they're bombarded with government TV ads telling them Enjoy difference, start tolerance. Trump homophobia. Granted, that's a fair point because Trump is executing gay people. Oh no, wait, that's what Islamic countries do under Sharia law. Oh yeah, and Talking of Sharia law, who was one of the main organisers behind the Women's March in DC? Lisa Sansour, a Muslim activist who advocates for Sharia law, a doctrine that completely disenfranchises women. Sharia law versus women's rights. Yeah, pick one because you can't have both. Some of the attendees at the Women's March in DC wore hijabs. Probably not for the same reason that Muslim women in the Middle East wear hijabs. Which is so they don't get beaten and raped. But let's just keep on pretending that the hijab isn't an international symbol for the oppression of women. Okay. Islam does not silence me, it empowers me. Yeah, try and protest for women's rights in in Saudi Arabia and see how empowered you feel. Good luck. Oh yeah, and the only people who marched on the Saudi embassy, you know, an Islamic theocracy that actually oppresses women, were Trump supporters. Well, imagine my shock. This is what I've warned about for years. The left is now openly making an alliance with Islamists and Islamism. And it kind of makes sense because both Islamists and the far left broadly share the same goal the complete destruction of Western civilization. Oh, don't take my word for it. Read ISIS's own manifesto where they talk about recruiting left-wing activists because they're on the same page. Look at how far-left rioters try to intimidate Trump supporters by showing them ISIS flags and beheading videos. Listen to the rhetoric at the Women's March. Madonna wanting to blow up the White House. Yes, I have thought an awful lot about blowing up the White House. Leftists all over Twitter celebrating and advocating violent attacks on people with whom they disagree politically. Violent attacks to advance a political objective. Now what word could we possibly use to describe that? Hmm, I wonder. Yeah, but he's a Nazi. Why are you defending a Nazi? Yeah, that's got nothing to do with it. The far left literally labels anyone who disagrees with them as a Nazi. You can't go around punching people in the street because you claim they're a Nazi. 
whether they're actually a Nazi or not. Violently attacking people in the street to intimidate them out of expressing their political beliefs. Now, where have I seen that before? Oh, that's right, in Nazi Germany. Yeah, let's be like them. Great idea. So the left is embracing Islamism, the most intolerant belief system on earth. They're embracing intimidation. They're embracing violence. They're embracing completely deranged, frothing, hysterical behavior. <laughs> While the leftist media legitimizes all this violence and hatred by refusing to denounce it and labeling it as just another form of protest. You're witnessing the submission and capitulation of the West, but it can only take place with the willing complicity of the left, who have now brazenly decided to make an alliance with the most regressive belief system ever devised. Yet they make an alliance against conservatives, against Christians, against Israel. They make an alliance. What happens to feminists in Saudi Arabia or Iran? What happens to homosexuals in countries with Sharia? Well, this week we see what begins to happen in this regard. Uh, took place in London the Gay Pride Parade. The Islamic community began raising Gehenna and complaining. Originally, Peter Thatcher, the leader of the homosexual activist movement in the UK, called for an alliance between Muslims and homosexuals to fight the powers that be, those subscribing to traditional Judeo-Christian values. Essentially, that's what it came to. It wasn't phrased that way, but that's what it came to the liberation of Muslims and the liberation of homosexuals. He called for cooperation with Islam. Well, now the Islamic community at the London so-called Gay Pride Parade didn't quite see it that way. I'm reading from the text. Muslim leaders have made a formal complaint to Pride of London about what they see as Islamophobia in the banners, according to the Evening Standard. These include slogans such as Allah is gay, an East London mosque incites murder of lesbians, gays, transvestites, transgenders, homosexuals, etc. These people have a natural acrimony towards each other, but they will stick together against Bible-believing Christians who hold to traditional Judeo-Christian moral values and family values. They will stick together against the common enemy. This is precisely what happened with the Pharisees and Sadducees. And it's exactly what took place this week in prophecy. Let's move on. The Islamic Relief Chairman uh, seems to hate Jews and love Jihad, according to Islamic Watch. But this week in prophecy, something astounding took place. How this man can get public funding for Islamic Relief Society, I don't know. He's been aligned repeatedly with the Muslim Brotherhood and other organizations that have been designated as terrorists, even in Muslim countries. We speak of Khalid Lamada, an Egyptian-American who should not have ever had American citizenship, who was an opponent of General Assisi and a backer of the Muslim Brotherhood that supports Hamas. What is this man even doing in a civilized country? Why isn't he in prison or deported back to Egypt where they can put him in prison where such a man belongs in the thinking of the Egyptian government? Yet Islamic Relief gets funding from the American government for charitable operations when he openly sings the praises of radical Islamic terrorists celebrating those who've killed Jews. He speaks of the Mujahideen of Egypt, and he expresses a hate for Jews and an admiration of violence against Israel. Writing and uh, sharing the posts mostly in Arabic, these are not in English, that's how he avoids being traced by the media what he says, he writes it in Arabic. He circulated texts praising 
jihad expresses Islamic terror. Yet he gets funding. Why are organizations like his and the Council of American Islamic Relations allowed to operate? Again, Mr. Trump is very much a this far, no further man. He reminds me of some of the better kings of Judea in the Old Testament. He goes so far, but he wouldn't take down the high places. He will not stand up to organizations like CAIR or Islamic Relief, and he will not offend the Saudi Arabians, who do not simply need to be offended. They need to be bulldozed and held accountable for what they did in funding Al-Qaeda, bringing about September 11th. I've repeatedly called for the freezing of Saudi assets in the United States and the right of families of September 11th victims to sue the Saudi government, which is the House of Saud. But of course, James D. Baker, the Bush family, the Carlisle group, all took the side of the Saudis. Quite a situation. It's all about money, corruption, and hypocrisy. The only thing we can say about Mr. Trump thus far in his dealing with Islam and radical Islam is that it is a lesser of evils. No, he's not as bad as Bush. You'd have to be Benedict Arnold to be as bad as Bush. He's not as bad as Barack Obama. You'd have to be Benedict Arnold to be as bad as Barack Obama. He's not as bad as Hillary Clinton. But he's not good either, at least not thus far. I pray that he will change his tune. I believe that God will bless him if he does. Now, I can editorialize on political issues expressing my own opinion, but my theological opinion is separate because it's not my opinion. It's what the Word of God says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. By blessing Islamic relief, we are cursing Israel, and we are in affront to the face of God. When you bless those who persecute Arab Christians, and who are violently anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist in solidarity with acts of murderous terror. You need to read Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Rex Tillerson, Mr. McMasters, and President Trump. You should remind them, Vice President Pence, you're a Christian. I know you know better. But let's move on this week in prophecy. The Palestinian leadership led by Abu Abbas this week congratulated the North Korean regime and actually congratulated them. We read the following. Abbas made no affinity of his... I'm sorry, stop Abbas made no secret of his affinity for the regime in Pyongyang and issued a statement congratulating Kim on the occasion of North Korea's Liberation Day. He's congratulating the North Koreans? If you were a Christian in North Korea, you get arrested. You're put into a death camp. Your children get arrested and your grandchildren get arrested because you are a Christian. They arrest three generations of people and put them in internment camps. Imagine you're a Christian, your whole family goes to jail, your grandchildren go to jail, your children and your grandchildren, little kids. But they're congratulated by the Palestinian Authority for which the American taxpayer is supposed to gratefully finance. Mr. Trump, what is wrong with you? You've locked horns with the North Koreans, and you're taking our money, our money, and subsidizing an organization that sings their praises. We've warned repeatedly that Iran and North Korea are in bed with each other. The Pentagon knows it, the CIA knows it, MI6 knows it, the Israeli Mossad knows it, everybody knows it. That technology being developed 
in North Korea with the help of the Chinese will wind up in the hands of Iran and from Iran into the hands of radical Islamic terrorists. Obama sold us down the river. He betrayed us. Mr. Trump, there is no validity in law of the agreement made by John Kerry and Barack Obama with Iran. The treaty was never verified by the Senate. There's no real agreement with any legal force. Why don't you just end it and end it now? Treat Iran for what they are. Again, Mr. Pence, have a chat with your boss, Mr. Trump. But before you do so, Mr. Pence, may I humbly and respectfully suggest you read the book of Daniel, chapter 10, concerning Iran, so you know what you're dealing with? Why are we subsidizing as American taxpayers, as European taxpayers, as British taxpayers? Why are we subsidizing, both directly and indirectly, Abbas and the Palestinian Authority, who are paying tribute to the North Koreans? That's what took place this week in prophecy. You can't win this way. You just can't win. It began on September 11th, when the Bush family were in bed with the Saudi Arabians who are responsible for September 11th. Most of those terrorists were from Saudi Arabia. The funding for Al-Qaeda came from members of the House of Saud. When the President of the United States in the Oval Office is controlled by political and financial and oil interests. And the Saudi Arabians have him and his family in their back pocket. How can you defeat an enemy like that when you don't recognize them as an enemy? How can you take our money and give it to a boss? How can you allow these Islamic organizations to operate? As we've said repeatedly, Islam, fundamentalist Islam, is the judgment of God on the backslidden Judeo-Christian world. It is God's judgment on America, God's judgment on Britain and Europe, God's judgment on Australia, it's God's judgment on Israel. But when I read the book of Isaiah, I realize that God's judgment is coming on the Arab Islamic world and his judgment will come on Iran. Judgment, however, begins in the house of God. This week in prophecy, let's continue. In Virginia, you have a growing Islamic population of people who should not have visas to live in the United States, who should be deported, most of them, you have Saudi-funded schools teaching Salafist Islam, inherently jihadist, and a mosque that is a regular stopping place for Democrat and some Republican politicians. Right now, Lieutenant Governor Ralph Northam, the Democrat nominee in the gubernatorial race, is visiting this mosque, singing their praises. The Dulles Area Muslim Society Center is attached to this mosque. Uh, they're, of course, opposed to the policies of the Trump administration on the Islamic ban. Well, it's not an Islamic ban. It's a security ban, not allowing people in unless we can screen who they are. But we're told the lie that it's a ban on Muslims. Now, whether there should be a ban on Muslims, that can be debated. That can be debated. But there is no ban on Muslims. Neither has been a, there ever been a call for a ban on Muslims. They're lying. But you think after Orlando, after San Bernardino, after September 11th, after what happened this morning in Barcelona, Crooked politicians would not be able to get away with this hypocrisy of pandering to radical Islam in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. 
try building a church in a Christian information center in the suburbs of Tehran in Iran or of Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. See what they tell you. There is a poetic justice. When you have an Islamic takeover, the first ones they're going to be head are going to be homosexuals, liberals, feminists. God has given them a spirit of blindness, stupidity, irrationality. They lie automatically. They lie so much, they actually believe the lie to be the truth, that there's a Muslim ban. In Turkey, the Jewish community has dwindled to 17,000. There are only 17,000 Jews left in Turkey. But because they're Jewish, they're called Israelis by most people in Turkey. They're Turkish citizens, they were born in Turkey, they speak Turkish as their mother tongue. Some know Ladino, a few Hebrew, but those would be the minority who speak Hebrew. Yet they're called Israelis. Well, something is growing in Turkey. A mutawa, a religious police. Turkey is tipping further and further under the Erdogan regime into the direction of jihad and into the direction of Sharia. The Istanbul government is giving more and more credence to neo-Ottoman anti-Semitism. Turkey is becoming more and more racist. Turkey is becoming more anti-Semitic. Turkey is becoming more and more anti-Western and it is becoming more like other Islamic countries. Uh, you've got protests of Christmas, protests of Christian holy days in Turkey. Protests. What would happen if Ramadan was protested in America or Europe? The left would be up in arms. Again, you have a willful blindness and a willful dishonesty by the mainstream media by left-wing academics and by the liberal idiocracy, crooked politicians of both parties. Story continues. As described in Ezekiel 38 and 39, apart from the Gog and Magog conflict that takes place at the end of the millennium in the book of Revelation, if there is another one preceding it that prefigures the ultimate one, Turkey must be a central player in it. Watch this space. But let's continue looking this week in prophecy. The Canadian government has finally come to terms with facing a problem. The problem is a simple one. You have border invasions increasing from the United States into Canada. Because of the crackdowns in the United States, more and more illegal aliens are now entering Canada illegally. And there's going to be a social repercussion. These will not simply be Latin Americans. Some of them will be Islamic and Islamists. Under Justin Trudeau, the Canadian government has given carte blanche to Islamic immigration that includes fundamentalists who are never going to Canadianize any more than they're going to Americanize or Europeanize or Australianize. Never! He's creating a social time bomb. There's already been radical Islamic attacks in Canada and more will happen. This is the direct result of the policies of the Trudeau government in Canada that has paid homage, even financial payouts to terrorist murderers. It's intensifying and it's going to get worse. In the seven months since Prime Minister Justin Trudeau welcomed the world to claim refugee status in Canada, more people than ever are heeding his call, we are told. 
in one prominent article. Canada has become something of a backup for the United States for open immigration. Again, this article describes it as a revolving back door. Quite accurate. But it's happened in major population centers. Montreal, Quebec, Manitoba, Toronto, Regina, and it's getting worse. What we're seeing, according to the reports, are people entering, just leaving debris and filth all over the place. Uh, soiled nappies. Uh, garbage. Used tampons and personal hygiene products. Used condoms. Just leaving them out on the trail. This is what Mr. Trudeau wants Canada to be turned into, apparently. This is what his policies are beginning. And the police, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, their hands are tied. Their hands are tied by the Trudeau regime. Nations get the leaders they deserve. And Canada is becoming no exception. At least this week in prophecy, we finally see it happening and we see it being reported for what it is. Again, there are enough stupid leftists in Canada, just as there are enough stupid leftists in Europe and America to turn a blind eye to it. But they will reap what they sow. Again, I point out, it is no coincidence that the people who were killed in Orlando were all homosexuals murdered by the Muslims. That's a product of the policies of the left. You want to unite with Islam? Go ahead, see what you're going to reap. Again, it is a poetic justice. It's a reap what you sow situation. As sickened and disgusted I was by the attack on Orlando, there's a reason the Muslims targeted homosexuals. If the left claims to be pro-gay and pro-Islam, it's going to happen. The same as it's happening in London. But let's continue. This week in prophecy. The world has been entertained by those religious clowns propagating the September 23rd delusion, following in the footsteps of the Mark Biltz Blood Moons nonsense. But people are overlooking something else. Tisha B'Av, the 9th of August. The 9th of August is the day of the Jewish calendar year. This year, Tisha B'Av, we call it the 9th of August, but it can vary according to the lunar and solar calendar, falls on the 21st of August, the 9th of the heat of the Jewish month of Av. It is on that day, according to the lunar calendar, that both the first and second temples were destroyed. The first temple destroyed in 585-586 BC by the Babylonians, the second in 70 AD by the Romans, fulfilling the prophecies of Daniel and Jesus, recorded by Josephus in Wars of the Jews. This is Tisha B'Av. To this day, liturgically, the Megillah Eha, the scroll or the book of Lamentations, is written with a time of fasting and mourning, the destruction of both temples on the same day. This year, Tisha B'Av will have something unique and unusual on the 21st of August. Again, we usually say 9th of August simply because the month of Av broadly corresponds to our Julian month of August similar to Easter, Passover, Hanukkah, Christmas, etc. Same kind of thing. But on the 21st of August, an eclipse will take place. That will be a solar eclipse. But it will not be like most solar eclipses. It will be something extremely rare. It will only be visible in one country in the world, basically. 
in the United States. Only in the United States will this solar eclipse be visible on Tisha B'Av. A group of Orthodox rabbis in Israel, joined by a group of evangelical pilgrims and tourists, have heralded this as a divine warning or an omen to the United States and its people as a divine message. It says in Genesis 1.14, God declares that he is creating the sun and the moon for signs and for seasons and for days and years. But the word signs is in there. The sun and the moon were created in the stars. And we're about to see the heavens declare. Well, Luke 21, 25, Jesus says there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. <laughs> and what do we have? We have solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, and the Revelation 12 signed in the heavens. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. The, the events that have happened since the blood moons, could we just kind of name some of them? Well, uh, you did have a war in Israel. Uh, during the uh, the month of Av. As a matter of fact, I flew all the way to Israel on the 9th of Av, Tisha B'Av, uh, with a group of pastors to comfort Israel during that time. Uh, but you saw a war in Israel. You see all these terrorist attacks. You see uh -huh. the rise of ISIS. Uh, you see uh, natural disasters, all kinds of things. But to me, the main thing of the blood moons was God wants his church to repent, just like you're talking about. What I thought was fascinating, I saw this in the news the other day, you can Google this. They say the exact path of the solar lunar eclipse, or solar eclipse, I mean, the, the exact path of the solar eclipse across the United States voted 95% for Trump. And the fascinating thing to me is God is not interested so much in the heathen to repent as much as he wants the church to repent. Okay, judgment always begins with the house of God. And uh, I believe God, it, it's a warning that, that we need to take the lead. As believers, God is telling us it starts first with us and we need to repent. And it so uh, happens, uh, does anyone know when that eclipse is falling on the biblical calendar? This is why you need no. God's day timer. Mm -hmm. You can only have a solar eclipse on a new moon, okay? And Israel was to base their calendar on the new moon. Well, it so happens we're about to enter the month of Elul, and the month of Elul is known as the month of repentance. It was on Elul 1 that Jonah left for 40 days to tell Nineveh to repent. It was on Elul 1 that Moses went up to Mount Sinai after the sin of the golden calf trying to make atonement while Israel was repenting for that. It was on Elul 1 that Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days coming back out on Yom Kippur. Elul 1 is the month of repentance and to have this solar eclipse happening at this time, uh, it is huge significance, which we will get into more later. I can't wait. I want to know what do you think this means? This is strange. Well, I think it, basically it means that we as a church, we have 40 days to really repent. Just like, uh, you know, Abraham, he was interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, trying to find at least 10 righteous. I don't know how many righteous is needed for America, but I, I believe, and this is what uh, they're taught in Judaism from even 2,000 years ago. I have books from 2,000 years ago and what they taught. And they said because the, uh, the Gentiles go by the sun for their calendar, a solar eclipse represents judgment coming upon a nation. A lunar eclipse, because Israel goes by the moon, refers to judgment coming upon Israel. Okay, or to repent, you know, they need to repent. And so this, uh, one thing, uh, I'll go ahead and mention it now. Go, yeah, do. Uh, many people don't realize this, but World War I started in uh, August of 1914, and there was a total solar eclipse over Eastern Europe and the Ottoman Empire. And what happens? You have this total solar eclipse, beginning of World War I, and the Ottoman Empire is destroyed. It even went over Nineveh, the same place mm -hmm. as where Jonah was. And most wow. people don't even know the story of Jonah, except from the Bible. We read it, and we saw they repented. 
but we don't know how God and Jonah didn't know, which is why he fled, how God was preparing the ground before he went. Did you know there was a plague? This, they were found these cuneiform tablets uh, talking about the ancient uh, Assyrian history. And they said there was a major plague three years before Jonah came. That was followed by a civil war. Maybe they were blaming each other for the plague in Nineveh. That was followed by another plague. Then, and NASA records this, it's one of the most famous eclipses in all of history called the Bersagale Eclipse. It happened, a total solar eclipse over Nineveh a month before Jonah came. Jonah comes and he says, repent. Well, that's why they were so willing to repent. They've already suffered from a major plague, a civil war, another plague, a total solar eclipse over Nineveh. And then here comes Jonah saying, you better repent. Now, obviously the solar eclipse, they didn't receive judgment because they repented. It didn't happen for a while. Mm -hmm. So just like I never set dates for anything, but what I do say is look at the events that happen on God's calendar so you know if it's God who's speaking or not. And then hopefully we repent and judgment is stayed. But I believe judgment, because it's falling at a low one over, and this is the first time a solar eclipse has ever gone over the entire United States and nowhere else in over 100 years. The last one was World War I, and guess what? It World was on, War, it was World one. War I, and it was on August 21st, the same as this one. Wow. I am skeptical of this for several reasons. The first reason is astral phenomena described in scripture that is of prophetic importance is never an eclipse. It's never an eclipse. It is more divine intervention in the celestial cosmos, like God stopping the sun altogether in the book of Joshua or reducing a day from 24 to 16 hours in the book of Revelation, or some cosmological sign, as in the signs seen by the wise men from the prophecy in the book of Numbers, that a star shall come from Jacob, or then they will see the sign of the Son of Man. Things described in the book of Joel, Revelation, Acts chapter 2, and so forth. But eclipse is never listed among them. Secondly, Tisha B'Av is Judeo-centric. It has a specific meaning for Israel and the Jews. The principles of it can be applied to the church, but its actual prophetic meaning is concentrated on Israel. I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical. But it still makes a lot more sense scripturally than the September 23rd Virgo nonsense, when it's not 12 stars anyway, only nine, three are planets. It makes a lot more sense astronomically and a lot more sense historically and theologically. I do not write it off as 100% nonsense, but I do say I'm skeptical of it. Nonetheless, it does make more sense than what these crazy date setting people are saying about September 23rd. 21st of August will be to Shabbat. When Orthodox Jews will read the Book of Lamentations and commemorate the destruction of both temples. When Jeremiah was rejected, the Babylonians destroyed the first temple. When Yeshua, Jesus, was rejected, the Romans destroyed the second. In both cases, it was prophesied in the word of God. God gave the Jews a full generation from the time of Jesus to 70 AD to repent and accept him as Messiah. Scriptural Judaism has not existed since 70 AD. The events of 70 AD are historically traumatic in their significance, but they're also of prophetic importance in understanding the return of Jesus. The events surrounding 70 AD what happened on Tisha B'Av ultimately is a picture of the return of Christ. We've explained this on several of our teaching tapes. The fact that an eclipse is taking place that day that's only visible mainly in one nation, mainly. You might be able to see as aspects of it in nations neighboring or bordering the United States, but it will basically be something visible 
only in the United States. Uh, is interesting. It's interesting, but I could not say it's prophetic. What I can say, however, is that if you were to give me a choice between taking something seriously with September 23rd, the Virgo nonsense on one hand, and Tisha B'Av with the solar eclipse on the other, I would take Tisha B'Av the 21st of August with the solar eclipse. These Christian pilgrims who joined the rabbis said it as a divine warning to America because of America's moral landslide concerning homosexuality, same-sex marriage, and the rest of it. In principle, God is trying to warn America. Whether or not the eclipse has anything to do with it, well, different people will have different views, but it cannot be proven biblically. No, I'm not saying it's prophetic, but I am saying it is indeed interesting. That is This Week in Prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you from the UK. Looking forward to seeing you next week in the United States. God bless and thank you for listening.